In this lesson, we're going to take a look at the magnitude of the induced potential difference when a magnet moves through a coil. So we saw in class with the hand generator that the graph of the induced potential difference over time as the magnet fell through the coil looked like this. It had an upward peak and then a downward peak and then back to zero. And we understand already the reason that the direction changes. So the direction for this part is one way and the direction here is the other way. We can understand that from Lenz's law. But why does the value of this voltage change? This is like having a battery that not only changes direction from one orientation to the other, but actually has a varying amount of pressure difference that it's supplying. So we want to understand why is this value higher than this value? Why is this value um, greater in magnitude than, say, this value here? So, reading through the top part of the sheet with you, it says, using the hand generator, we observed that when the magnet moved all the way through the coil, not only did the potential difference or voltage change directions, but it varied in magnitude as well. If the circuit is complete, then this varying potential difference will induce a current that changes direction and also has a varying magnitude. We found that the direction of the induced current and potential difference is determined by how the flux is changing. The direction of the induced current will be such that its magnetic field opposes the change in flux. This is called Lenz's law. But what determines the magnitude of the induced potential difference? Why is it small sometimes and large at other times? So number one, let's begin by looking at the flux at different times as the magnet moves to the left through the coil or the coil moves to the right over the magnet. Refer to each flux diagram below and record the flux in the table. Then graph the magnetic flux versus time. So this is the same diagram you had in last week's homework. And I'll just get you started. Using the flux diagrams, we can see here that the flux would be 2. So magnetic flux through the coil is 2 at time 1. This is time 1, time 2, and so on. So go ahead, pause the video, and complete the table. Now that the table is complete, we're ready to make a graph. Already we can see that the flux increased, was at its greatest, greatest amount of flux when the coil was in the middle of the magnet, and then the flux decreased. So go ahead once again, pause the video, and make your graph of magnetic flux versus time. I have plotted the flux and now I'm going to connect it with a smooth curve to show the basic shape. Moving on to question two, go ahead and answer this question. Describe what this graph tells you about the flux as the magnet goes through the coil. Number three, now let's look at the rate of change of the flux how quickly the flux is changing at different moments. Go back to the flux diagrams and determine the change in flux that occurs during each time interval, filling in the table below. The symbol for change in flux is delta phi, so change in flux per time interval is delta phi over delta t. That quantity would also be called the rate of change of the flux. So what we're doing here is going back to these diagrams and instead of recording the actual flux, we want to find the change in flux. So in order to do that, I am first actually going to write down the flux. So the flux here was 2, 5, 11, 20, 26. What we're looking for here is the change in flux. So from this diagram to this diagram, we had a change of plus 3. From this time to this time, we had a change of plus 6. It went from 5 to 11. Those are the values that you want to record in the table. So for the first time interval, which was from 1 second to 2 seconds, the change in the flux 
was plus 3 for that time interval. And the next one was plus 6. If the flux decreases, then you would have a negative value. Go ahead, pause the video, and complete your chart. Once your chart is complete, take a look at the values. This is interesting. We can see that these numbers increase from positive 3 to positive 9 and then back to positive 3. And then negative from negative 3 to negative 9 and then to negative 3. So what this tells us is that we don't have a constant rate of change. We don't have a change of 3 in each time interval. First it changes by 3, then it changes by even more, an increase. Then we have an increase of even more in a time interval. Now here we still have an increase, but it's less of an increase. So the rate of change is changing over time. Go ahead now and plot your graph. When your graph is completed, it should look like this. And let's now move to number four, which is interpreting the graph. It says, on your graph, label when the south pole enters the coil, when the middle of the magnet is in the coil, and when the north pole enters the coil. So pause the video and identify those points on your graph. To identify these points, it might be helpful to look back at this diagram. So we can see that the positive 9 change in flux happened when the coil was right at the point where the south pole was going in. And then we had the smallest amount of flux, change in flux here. This is where it's crossing the zero. So you can actually see not a lot of change in flux from one place to another here. And then, once again, another large decrease in flux when the North Pole enters the coil. So this peak is the South Pole entering the coil. Here, the zero point is the middle of the magnet, and this is when the North Pole enters the coil. So what does this mean? This is telling us that the flux is changing the fastest when we have the poles at the point where the coil is. The flux changes the least at the middle of the magnet and when the poles are far away from the coil. From the flux diagrams and the graph, we can see that the flux does not change the same amount during each time interval. The rate of change of the flux starts out small, but increases as the magnet approaches the coil. So here we had a rate of change of 3, then a rate of change of 6, and then a rate of change of 9. As the south pole enters the coil, the flux is changing at the fastest rate. That was our value of 9. Then the rate of change of flux decreases and reaches a value of 0 when the middle of the magnet is in the coil. Then as the magnet continues to move through the coil, the flux begins to change faster again. And when the north pole is in the coil, the flux is changing at the fastest rate again. So it's changing now by, by decreasing but how much it decreases each time interval is changing. Here it decreases by 3, decreases by 6, decreases by 9, which is the greatest decrease. Now a decrease of 6, and then back to a decrease of 3, which is a smaller decrease. This graph of the rate of change of flux, delta phi over delta t versus time, is similar to the graph of induced potential difference versus time for the hand generator. So we can compare and we can see the similarity, an up peak and a down peak, an up peak and a down peak. The reason the shapes are not more exact is because this data that we're using for our graph here is kind of manufactured. It's not real flux data. It turns out that the amount of potential difference that is induced is proportional to the rate of change of the flux. It is not proportional to the actual amount of flux. Okay, it's not proportional to these values. This is the amount of flux. It's not proportional to that. It's proportional to the rate at which the amount of flux is changing. And that's what this graph is showing us. It's showing us the rate of change of the flux. This magnitude of the induced potential difference also depends on the number of loops in the coil. The more loops there are, the greater the amount of induced potential difference. This equation 
can be written this way. Induced potential difference equals the number of loops in the coil times the rate of change of flux. In symbols it looks like this, and this equation is called Faraday's Law. Potential difference is often called EMF, which stands for electromotive force. That's something you should be aware of because you will read that in textbook problems. The textbook includes a negative sign to indicate that the direction of the potential difference is opposite that of the change in flux, but we will work only with magnitudes and we will find the direction of the induced potential difference or current using Lenz's law. Let's practice applying Faraday's law to sample problem A, which is also in your textbook. 